And I think at the time when I played here, for me to get picked for Scotland was like winning the lottery without buying a ticket. Give him the ball and he would you could guarantee he would get the ball across and uh, the number of chances that he created and the goals he scored himself. Great player. He got the ball and, and yeah, everyone stood up immediately. He didn't if it could be in our penalty area, it didn't matter. Tommy's got the ball and you know and he, he could just beat players for fun. Like well, I just, you don't really get them anymore, do you? You know, um, but like probably like I guess the Ronaldo of his times in a way. It was just fantastic to watch and uh, always delivered. When well, you had Mick Ferguson in the box, knocking down here Wallace, you know, I think we even finished sixth one year. I think it took a little while for the for for the crowd to come round to the way I used to play. Um, I don't think they took to me instantly. I think eventually, I think it was probably when Ian Wallace came along and we struck up a, a, a reasonable partnership um, that I think they finally got to understand in my type of game, my strengths if you like, and, and not always honing in on what might have necessarily been your weaknesses. Wally just seemed to know where I was going to put the ball and I just seemed to know where Wally was going to be. And it just sort of it just spiralled from there. And I remember the pitch was always fantastic. The groundsman was always really good and it was one of the best pitches in the league And it, 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 all of the time. Even when I played there as a professional and went on to play a lot of games, um, I always felt Highfield Road surface was always fantastic. The prodigal son returned in 1975 when Jimmy Hill came back to Highfield Road as a director. Five years later, he was chairman and made the controversial move of turning Highfield Road into an all-seater stadium. It's harder to be a hooligan sitting down. That was a phrase that I invented, and in selling it to people who were against it and suspicious of it and worried how much it was going to cost, I was never in any doubt that it was the thing to do. I mean, some things you do in life and you know you're taking a chance. Sometimes you put a bit of money on a horse and you think it's going to win and it doesn't. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't have any doubts that that was the way in which football had to go. I think the club, when I came here, and even going to other clubs, uh, they were put, he was, his thinking was probably ten years ahead of everybody else with the changing rooms, with the dressing rooms, uh, with the uh, training facilities, uh, with the way that we travelled. Uh, with the, the, the kit and equipment that we had, uh, even down to the kids and how we, we looked after the kids, even as senior players, we had to mix with the, with the, youth, with the youth kids and we had a great, I think we would probably were one of the first ones that had a hostel actually on the ground, so the kids had somewhere to come, it wasn't a case of getting stuck in digs somewhere. The early part of the 80s would prove a tense time for Coventry, as last day wins to avoid relegation became a regular occurrence, including a 4-1 over champions Everton in 1985. Well, they were highly pressurised, as you can imagine. Um, the first time I was here, 84-85, we had to win the last three to stay up. And we've never, ever done that. It was incredible performance. Uh, we won at uh, Stoke away, Luton here and Everton at home. Uh, and the pressure's on. I mean, been in the been in a championship in the top flight for th nearly 30 years and to go down uh, was uh, incredible. But the last game against Everton here, beating them 4-1 or 4-2 I think it was, was an incredible scene. It was like winning the FA Cup, it really was. The fans surviving in the top flight, uh, it was a great day. I mean, in the sunshine in May, beating Everton, can't get any better. But we shouldn't be there in the first place. The atmosphere after the game was just relief and just unbelievable that they'd annihilated the champions and Everton had a really good side out. Um, it's just fantastic. My best memory is um, we beat Everton 4-1, our last game of I think 84 season and we had, to, we had to win four in a row to stay up and we won them all three and then Everton with the champions came down here and uh, we beat them 4-1, it was fantastic, it was sunny, it was April, you know, they were already champions and, uh, and we invaded the pitch which was the only time I've ever done it. But it was the days when they had the fencing and, and the paint across the top, so we all got covered in pink paint and things like that. But no one cared at the time. It was just, um, yeah, that was fantastic. There were some good performances by the lads, really, in that match. They needed to be, but at the same time, you know, it was a hard match. Hard match to sit and suffer, I promise you, as a supporter. I hated every minute of it until the final whistle. I remember the, the fans' reactions, the players' reactions. It was almost as if we'd won something at the end of it. We'd only just staved off relegation. We should have been hiding the faces, really. But it really was as if we'd you know, got promoted or won something. Such was the excitement that uh, 
you know, that there was at the time. Coventry City were making the headlines for all the right reasons in 1987, however, as Highfield Road was transplanted to Wembley for an historic afternoon. Everyone was like round the road here and all camped out in tents and stuff, waiting to get um, the tickets for the FA Cup final. I looked at it and I thought, yeah, we're going to win a cup. That's what I stated and it was all in the press. So it says he'll win the cup. I didn't mean that cup. Didn't mean the FA Cup, I meant the Leamington Hospital Cup because we won it every year we played. <laughs> Trying to be smart, I like turned around and uh, I've been sort of stuck with my own words. And from there on in, I thought, right, we'll show them we can win a cup. People don't believe me, I've watched it four times. That's all. Because I want to keep the memories without having to look back at them. Mm. I've got them, they're there every day with me. I think there's some part of that final every day, I don't forget. I don't forget one part. I remember even walking out of the tunnel, you know, and the proudest moment of my life. And you hear Kill Klein and Captain behind us, should we let the fat devil go out on his own? You know, and you hear those sort of things going on. And great, great moments to walk out on Wembley and to hear the crowd, the roar is deafening. We actually warmed up in the tunnel in them days, you weren't allowed out on the pitch to do your warm-up. So the first time you actually went out for the crowd proper was to go out and do the match. And as you kind of broke from the tunnel, you break into that brilliant sunshine and that colour and that noise and uh, mind-blowing, fantastic memories. I think we had third, uh, well, three quarters of uh, the ground were full with Coventry fans, I think, that day. So it's, uh, you know, it's like a home match for us, really, in a way. You know, I think obviously the neutrals were supporting us as well because uh, we were the underdogs, I think. And, you know, and it went a long way, you know, to, to helping us, I think, having that support. The stadium was a blazing with sky blue. Uh, everybody, you know, that could get a ticket got one. Uh, I, I would have thought all the black market tickets went to sky blue fans. And uh, it was a terrific day, you know, especially when you bear in mind that we, we went down. I think we were losing, you know, twice in the game and ended up winning 3-2. You know, it did go down. It's probably one of the uh, best cup finals of the era. No, I remember looking up. And I said a little prayer to my mother. I said, Mum, we've made it. The tactics had all been to keep a clean sheet for 20 minutes. Vital against the side like Tottenham. You hold them for 20 minutes. And the game starts in two minutes, you've gone a goal down. And Big George looked at me and said, what are we doing now, Sal? I said, if I had a drink, I would take it. If not, I've got great belief in these players, George. They'll get back in the game. They'll win us this game. Don't worry, just sit there and relax. I must admit, I was lying at the time because <laughs> I thought, God, it could be seven. <laughs> Come on, lads, don't let us down. I think it was probably meant to be because the only way that ball could have gone in the net or the only place in the net that ball could have gone uh, was where it went and it was just maybe it was meant to be. I used to do a lot of after-dinner speaking. And one of the lines that I used to say during Ma Margaret Thatcher's day as Prime Minister, during her time as Prime Minister, I used to say, why has Margaret Thatcher chosen Coventry City as the training ground for British astronauts? The answer is because it's got no atmosphere. And I used to get well booed when there were Coventry supporters uh, present, but as soon as they won the FA Cup, I had to drop it from my act. The 90s saw further improvements at Highfield Road. The East Stand rose up out of the demolished Spion Cop at a cost of £4 million. On the pitch, relegation was always a threat, but there was still plenty for Sky Blues fans to smile about. <laughs>